every girl my age dreamt of going abroad to study, it took less than two minutes to shatter those dreams. I was there at 4 a.m. with my documents, my, my thick bag statements, and I'm not sure why we were there at 4, because my appointment was at 11. <laughs> I sat there, and this lady says, you know, uh, visa denied, you don't have enough social ties to tie you back to your mother country when you come back, for when you finish your studies. Whew. Picked up my documents. As I walked out, this point in time, I'm crying because I've let my parents down. And most of you know, when you're going to the embassy in my time, we would have prayers at night and uh, the aunties would sleep over to wait for the good news. <laughs> I didn't have good news. I cried. A year later, I got another opportunity to interview. Again, same script, same cast. This time around, my mother had a thermos of hot tea. And the same famous words were repeated. Eh, at this point, I'm, I'm not too clear we are understanding each other. What is this social ties? And she explained and said, young girl, social ties is you get married, you get children, have land, something to bring you back home. And I realized, Yvonne, it is what it is. <sighs> I'm not one to wallow in self-pity. So I collected myself. If Kuoga Kurudisoko was a person, <laughs> yours truly. I started tying those ties that I was told, you know, I had to get them. Got married, got children, an amazing job, thanks to Tasmin seated right there and my boss Maureen. Amazing, and I got on. I did my school, now I'm even doing my PhD. Mm, my parents were so proud. I had one brief in life was to make my parents proud. They had sacrificed so much for me, and that's the only thing I could give them. So while my story goes, I sat down and asked myself, how happy was I? Was I being true to myself? Was I living the life that I would look back at in my, you know, in my, my afterlife and say, Yvonne, you lived a good life? No, I wasn't. I realized some ties had to be untied, a tie that had given me identity. <laughs> and I woke up and I left my matrimonial home, scared, confused, lost. I'm now a single mother. 2020 was going to be a very strange year for me. I was determined to spend time with my ties, my children and my parents. And I went home. After being there for a few hours, I noticed my dad was not the jolly, happy man that I knew him to be. And then I asked him, Dad, would you like us to take you to hospital? <laughs> my dad was the true Kikuyu man and says, hey, hey, mm -hmm. no beetroot too, na cucumber, na mai, and your mother is doing such a good job. I just need to have beetroot, cucumber, and water, and your mother is doing a good job. But I asked him later, Dad, are you sure you're okay? He says, Mommy, to be honest, um, I'm tired, body and soul. I, that was not my dad's speak. So after the festivities, we started the hospital journey. Many, many tests later, many doctor visits. My dad, on the 27th of January, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I get a call from the doctor and he tells me, you need to come, we need to have a discussion. We have concluded. But I think it could be a eh, cancer. I told the doctor, please do not use the C word with me and not with my dad. So at this point, I call my BFF, Jaja, who's here. On a Thursday afternoon, I told her the news, I was incoherent, and she agreed to come and take me to the doctors. As we got closer to the clinic, I started freaking out and I'm shaking, I'm, you know, I'm talking things. And firmly and calmly, she stood in front of me and told me, Yvonne, we will not cry, we will hold it together. We will enter the good doctor's office, then we will go cry after. And I said, yes, ma'am. And that's what we did. We found the doctor armed with a thick file 
graphs. I didn't even know you can present medical results that way. And diagrams. And he broke the news to us. So long and short of it, he said, it's stage four. And there's nothing medically I can do for your father. This is a man who had never even gotten a cold. This is a man who had never been to hospital. Stage four cancer, my dad. Me, we're discussing cancer. My ties were untying thick and fast. We got out of the hospital and Jaja was able to break the news to my sister and we started planning. I refused to accept and I told the doctor, please don't discuss cancer with my father. Allow me to break the news to him. And I knew I was not going to tell him. And I pleaded with the doctor not to tell my father. So we leave and we start planning for India because I'd had India wax. I promise you, all of you need a friend like Jaja. I don't know where she came up with. We were meeting 15 Indian doctors every other evening on Zoom. At this point in time, I called the doctor again and I asked him, Dr. So what you mean is, my dad, we should just take him home and give him Panadol so that I just don't lose anything. I said, yes, Yvonne, that's what I mean. Damn, it was so difficult. My sister realized this girl is just not understanding the magnitude of pancreatic cancer. My sister is brutal. She called me and told me, Duta, that he has pancreatic cancer. It is an MJ bad of cancers. Dad has at least four months to live but we will do everything in our power to get him, to buy him more time. And that's what we did. But in the meantime, I spent a lot of time with my parents. At this time, my absenteeism at work is starting to get noticed. My performance is not tip top. My concentration out of the window. At home, my mom is wondering, why is this girl always home? You know, and then I asked my sister, does daddy know how to Google so that he doesn't Google the results? Then my mom asked mom, does daddy know how to Google the I was, I was very happy. So I was making sure he doesn't know he has cancer. I am broken. I am tired. I am fatigued. And I could not show my dad the despair. I hit rock bottom. Just when I thought rock bottom had just, you know, five basements. I was in basement seven. So one day, I, I could not take it anymore. I went home. Like on a Tuesday afternoon, drew my curtains and switched off my phones. And I slept. Jaja came home and found me in the darkness during the day, crying. And she switched on the lights, drew the curtains, and she told me, young lady, I'm going to say this once, so listen to me very carefully. All right? She said, you have so many balls in the air, Yvonne. And some are rubber balls, some are crystal balls. Rubber balls will fall and they'll bounce back. But your crystal ball, once it falls, it shatters and you'll be completely finished. Your children will bounce back, your school will bounce back. You're doing everything possible for your parents medically. So what is your crystal ball? And without thinking, I told her my job. She said, yes, your job is your crystal ball. It's going to keep you fed. It's going to pay the bills in India. It's going to keep you sane. So we have to make sure that you keep your job. She waited for me to shower and dropped me at the office. My parents went to India, and I thought, phew, now I can rest a bit, I can focus on my crystal ball, I can focus on my children who are barely seeing me and going through the motions of separation. But I was wrong. I only had two hours of sleep at the maximum. I, I barely slept. Every time I went to the office and somebody would tell me, what's wrong with your eyes? I would say, I have an infection. Then they asked me, if on this infection is not going, I said, ah, even me? I'm now starting to wonder what's wrong. <laughs> when my parents came back, you no, know, just before they came back, India was shut down. COVID outbreak, no, no aircrafts leaving, nothing. And my mom, my mom had a bougie palate. She loved chili, she loved uh, curries, how she was home. 
My dad, on the other hand, oof. So one day he called me very frustrated and said, Mommy, he woke no more shade. But a few months later, they came home. So I was happy. I'd been counting months. My sister told me four months. Now we are month seven. My father is still alive and getting better. My mom had joined my dad because she had a minor surgery in, out, and then they were best friends. So it was only logical they go together. They came back. I was very happy. I had them over at my house so that I can ask them to back to health. One Tuesday morning, my mom was looking a bit hmm, not okay. We rushed her to hospital, and 11 days later, she was dead. <laughs> I was confused. I was lost. I was shattered. My mom was the priest, the cornerstone of our home. <sighs> I remember calling a friend of mine, and I told him, hey, my mom is gone. And he asked me, Yvonne, are you sure it's your mom, not your dad? And at some point, I could share in their, in their confusion because it was my dad who was terminally ill. As fate would have it, we buried my mom on my dad's birthday. No one thought about it as we were planning. And it was so sad. I could touch my father's sadness. At this point in time, he's at his height of suffering the chemo side effects. He had lost weight, he was frail, he was tired. And he was sad he had lost his best friend. We came home, I looked at him, and I told him the deed is what it is. Mom is gone, we're going to move on like she'd have wanted us to. And we will do it together. Scared, but we'll do it together. My house was full. It was sad. It was like a withering onion with layers and layers of sadness. My ties had untied. My mom gone. My dad very sick. My marriage in the drains. My children very confused what's happening. Now we had Shoshu and Guka. They're not there anymore. And at this point in time, my dad was very scared. One Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, my dad had a stroke. I took him to a hospital, and in four days later, my father passed on. Barely 60 days after mom had gone. I was so upset with God. I was, I was confused, lost, shattered. Please remember, my glass ball is still in the air. As I went to prepare my dad's final resting place, my mom's grave was still very fresh. The flowers we had laid were still there. The Excel sheet we used for my mother was the same one we just whipped out and, and planned my father's funeral. My father had never told me how to deal. I was daddy's girl. I didn't know what to do. No one ever told me how to handle a situation like this. But you know what? It is what it is. They're, my dad is gone, and I had to do what I had to do to send him home <coughs> in a way and manner that he would have done it for me and the way he did it for my mother. I came back home a month later. In my own wisdom, and against better judgment, I said this was my pain season. I was going to deal with all the pain that life had to throw at me. And I asked myself, what can be worse than losing my mom and dad in a span of 30 days? The answer was nothing. I was wrong. I filed for divorce. I mean, it would have been easy. I'm the one who left. <laughs> I was so wrong. I came to learn my timelines and not the court's timelines. And the process, the process is crazy. But I got to learn that even if this was happening to me, I had ties that were anchoring me down. I had ties 
that have walked with me through this. Today, I'm alive. I'm right in front of you telling the story. The heartbeat was telling the story to myself. I had never posed and told this story to me. And me standing here today is nothing short of a miracle. I'm back to school. I am smiling again. I thought my smile had gone with my parents. I would wish my friends on every one of you, they carried me when I could not carry myself. They stood with me when I could not see, when my tunnel was so long and dark, when I hit level six basement, they stood with me. My sister, who's very far off, has been a very strong tie that has kept me sane. My brother reminds me of my mother. My uncle, Captain, reminds me of my father. I cry when I think about my parents, but the tears are becoming lighter. And I realized you can get through whatever life throws at you. You can untie any tie that doesn't serve your current or your future journey and purpose, and you will live and you will survive.